All right, let's get started. Once again, hello to everybody who's joined us. Welcome to SALDEF's first ever youth unity panel, Make Us Visible, Hearing and Understanding the Stories of AA, NHPI, and MASA Youth. My name is Jocelyn God, and I'm an intern at SALDEF. I was also part of the sick league class of 2021. Um, I'm a senior in high school from California, and I was able to spearhead this project, and I'll also be moderating the panel today. I'm joined today by five amazing youth activists from the AANHPI and MASA communities, and we're going to get around to introductions in just a few minutes here. But first, I want to introduce SALDEF for those of you guys who may not be familiar with the organization. SALDEF is a national Sikh American media, policy, and education organization. Our mission is to empower Sikh Americans by building dialogue, deepening understanding, promoting civic and po political participation, and upholding social justice, sorry, justice and religious freedom for all Americans. So just so you guys all get an idea of what to expect today, we're gonna to be starting out with introductions and then we're going to be, for the better portion of the panel, learning about the panelists' diverse backgrounds, understanding what it's like to be part of their community in America and learning how we can better be an ally to their community and better support them. Um, towards the end of the panel, you guys, the audience, are gonna have the opportunity to ask our panelists questions. So please, if you have any questions, um, be sure to drop them in the chat as we go. And we're gonna try to get to as many as we can by the end of the panel. So without further ado, um, let's get started. I see we have all of our panelists on video here. So I'm gonna briefly introduce all of you guys and then we'll jump right in. So to those of you guys who watch SALDEF and Dear Asian Youth's IG Live, um, you might recognize Parveen. Parveen will be representing the South Asian and Sikh American communities. She's a freshman at DePaul University with interest in public service and political science. She serves as a projects co-director at the Northeast Chapter's regional lead at Dear Asian Youth, a, a global student-led 501c3 that works to uplift Asian youth into intersectional empowerment while showcasing holistic representation in the Asian community. Next up, we have Joy, who's representing the Pacific Islander community. Joy is a senior studying health, society, policy, and international studies with a certificate in Pacific Island studies at the University of Utah. She's the daughter of Tongan Fijian immigrants with roots in Kalamatua, Tongo, Tonga, and Talavu, Fiji. Um, sorry, Joy, I may have pronounced that wrong. Um, if you want to come on really quickly and help out with that. Yeah, so my dad is from Kolomotua, Tonga, and then my mom is from Tailevu, Fiji. Thank you so much for that, and I apologize for pronouncing that wrong. Um, she was raised in South or Salt Lake City's thriving Pacific Islander community. Joy is passionate about helping fellow underrepresented students access college and engage in community-based work. So our next panelist is John, who's representing the Southeast Asian American community. John is a junior at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, pursuing his bachelor's with a major in political science and a minor in creative writing. John is a Bonner Scholar from Albuquerque, New Mexico, who is working to provide service in underserved communities. He's also a Friends Committee member on the National Legislation Advocacy Corps organizer, lobbying Senator Mike Braun, Senator Ted Young, sorry, Todd Young, and Representative Greg Pence for the Environmental Justice for All Act. And then we have Hiba, who's representing the Muslim American community. Hiba is a freshman at Cornell University who's study, studying global and public health sciences. An Indian Muslim, Hiba has been involved in advocacy work surrounding the South, South Asian and Muslim communities in New Jersey. She's passionate about connecting her interests in healthcare to her drive for community service and working towards causes such as healthcare equity and advocacy for minority groups. And last but not least, we have Nelson, who will be representing the Chinese American community. Nelson is a junior at Brown University studying public health and neuroscience. His work focuses on Asian American advocacy, community engaged research, and health equity. At Brown, he serves as the president of the Asian and American Political Alliance, an organization focused on Asian and American political engagement and community building. Nelson also worked as a policy research intern with Stop AAPI Hate during the summer of 2020, where he co authored a report on anti Chinese rhetoric signed in congressional resolutions and by the United Nations Human Rights Council. Boy, that was a lot. And as you guys can tell, our panelists are an incredibly accomplished group of youth activists. And I'm so thankful that you guys are all here today. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you all. So I think, first of all, we'd like to learn a little bit more about your diverse communities. So like I mentioned, all of you guys are here representing different communities that make up the broader A, NHPI, and MASA community. And as we all know, all these communities are very diverse. So we'd like to first start off by having you guys all share a little bit about your community and the history of your community in America. 
So John, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, I just want to say that I will do my best, but I am coming from a perspective of a Vietnamese American. So for all my Southeast Asians that are watching, if I don't correct or tell or narrate your story, I hope that you one day have a platform to say your own. But um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I um, from the US uh, census, I, I think we can all believe that there's been a booming and thriving um, outgrowing of the AA and HPI and MASA diaspora all around. And so at least from my um, life experiences, my family um, came to uh, New Mexico after the Vietnam War and they kind of settled. Um, and during that time, because of that uh, huge migration from the Vietnam War, there's been a thriving um, Vietnamese community that has been um, uh, uh, kind of uh, in, in fond of each other and as well as trying to as well make America their home and also find within themselves spaces within their own American identity um, to relate and to be able to communicate with their own kids and grandchildren um, and trying to as well heal um, even through after all these years from a war-torn nation and also from um, the uh, struggles of being an immigrant parent and also trying to as well raise um, your first gen American child. Um, and so I would say that's pretty um, much the sort of uh, history of uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, as long with, um, we're also, I would say like Albuquerque is like a mini like LA NYC like sort of hub for Asians. We obviously just don't have Vietnamese. We have a very rich um, Chinese population there, Japanese, Korean, and as well as Filipino um, and all the other ethnic communities that come. But um, I just want to say that um, at least within New Mexico, compared to the other states that you guys are probably going to be mentioning about, New Mexico has been forgotten as a border state. And so when it comes to the topic of immigration, it feels like at least Asian New Mexicans are really um, casted off. Um, and so I just want to put that out there. Thank you so much. And you make a really good point. You know, thank you for introducing your community. But you know, the point that you made about you know the Asian American community in New Mexico, I think that's really important. And that's another reason that this panel is so important. You know, to bring those stories to the forefront, the ones that maybe have been forgotten, that haven't been told. Um, so keep going with that. That sounds really great. Um, Nelson, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, thanks so much again for having me on this panel. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm Chinese American, born and raised, uh, but obviously the Chinese American community, um, even within the United States, has gone through, there is a plurality and um, definitely a heterogeneity in how um, Chinese Americans came to the United States. Um, obviously, there are folks that were, um, came to the United States to help build um, uh, labor uh, for the California gold rushes, and um, even recently, um, there has been influxes of Taiwanese uh, immigrants to the United States, um, influx of immigration from the mainland, and obviously there's been strained relationships between uh, Chinese Amer American immigrants in the United States um, through things like the Chinese Exclusion Act or just broad racialization and um, racialized violence against folks um, that have um, identified as Chinese Americans throughout a lot of uh, American history, and obviously that's um, come to a hallmark, uh, partially due to the pandemic and um, recent upticks in like racialized violence against people who um, simply identify as Asian, but um, broadly a lot of Sinophobic violence. But um, the Chinese American community as a whole, um, I live in New Jersey, my parents came here, um, my dad came here to get an education and he studied um, in New Jersey, and so I was born and raised here. Um, but yeah, the Chinese American community um, definitely there's diversity in how we got here and the education levels that we had coming here and um, but uh, we have built a lot of communities in a lot of major cities. New Jersey has a lot of Asian American folks and particularly Chinese American communities. Um, it's also prevalent in a lot of our neighboring cities. Um, New York City, Chinatown, one of my favorite places to be on this whole wide planet. So um, yeah, the Chinese American community has definitely um, left a nice stakehold in the United States and I hope that we can build that community going forward. Of course, and thank you for sharing. Oh, and Hiba, if you wanna jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was actually born and raised Indian Muslim. Um, so my parents uh, immigrated here in the 90s from India. And so I, that would make me second generation Indian. 
like Nelson, I'm also from New Jersey. So like he was saying, there is a very large Asian population there. So I guess I would say that I kind of come from a fortunate standpoint where I was lucky to grow up around a large um, Indian community, a large Muslim community, you know, having access to a lot of the resources, organizations, community centers that kind of were the places where I kind of grew up. Um, and just in terms of the, like the immigration to America, there is a lot, like everyone's story is very different. Um, but I would say that there have been like major waves as far as people immigrating from India are concerned. Um, so you did have a lot of people earlier on I think, and I, I remember learning this in history class and kind of understanding and connecting it to that, which is there was a huge change in like American immigration policies where they took off the quotas that were associated with like each country. So it's kind of like America, there was a point where it's very welcoming and very opening to immigrants from other countries. Um, and I think when that changed, you saw a lot of immigrants, you, people coming in as labor workers. My parents and my own dad came in, I, what I say like the third wave of immigrants, um, where you had a lot of people coming in in the tech field, so like science, IT, um, and they eventually like settled down, started families here. And I guess that's also why I'm here. And it's a, such a big um, community and it's grown to like really diversify. Jersey, I think is one of the places where you see a very large Asian population because um, a lot of the people that came in during that time kind of settled in those urban areas where they found the jobs. So you see a lot in like LA, in New York and surrounding kind of metropolitan. Um, yeah, and I think that there's definitely like so many, like every time I meet a new Muslim or I meet a new Indian, their narrative is very different. You always have something more to learn. So I hope that like what I say is just a part of my narrative that people can resonate with. But I really hope that like John was saying that there's a platform for everyone to kind of be able to share their story going ahead. But this is a great start. I can go ahead and answer um, next. So um, as was mentioned kind of in my introductions, I am Tongan Fijian, um, kind of here representing the Pacific Islander experience. And so um, first, I come from Salt Lake City, Utah. It was also mentioned where there is a large proportion of Tongan, Fijian, Samoan folks who live here. Um, I do want to recognize, though, that Pacific Islander does encapsulate a lot more than just the Polynesian islands that we may be familiar with. Um, there's also Micronesian and Melanesian communities that are often overshadowed even within Pacific Islander conversations. And so, as was mentioned by the other panelists, I only represent a small microcosm of such a diverse and just wide reaching community that really does have a lot to offer in terms of linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, geographical diversity. Um, and so speaking more towards that um, Tongan and Fijian experience here in the diaspora. And I use the term diaspora loosely because for a lot of other Pacific Islanders, diaspora doesn't accurately encapsulate their experience as we know the formal and informal ties that different island nations have to the US really dictate the experiences that you're gonna find there, for example, in Guam. And um, in Hawaii, it looks very different than what, you know, my Tongan and Fijian migrant parents had experienced. There wasn't necessarily a migration story. It was a lot more of a militarization and colonial story. And so speaking again to my experience um, in Salt Lake City, there's a lot of migrant um, Tongan, Fijian, Samoans, again, like I mentioned, and a lot of that is rooted in faith. And so a lot of folks have migrated here um, by their Christian faith, uh, Utah specifically is a hub for like Christian faiths, specifically the LDS church. And that's a pipeline that a lot of my community has been a part of. Um, but again, um, in the diaspora, our folks are located all over the Western seaboard and all over the United States. And so again, there's it just um, in an effort to, you know, encapsulate that diversity. I really echo what John has mentioned that I share only a small platform of what our people have to offer. And I hope that these conversations can continue so that we can explore the nuances between Pacific Islander experiences and what that means, not only for us as Pacific Islanders, but within the broader um, umbrella term of AAPI, AANHPI and MASA, what our role is and how we can again, explore that nuance. Thank you, Joy. And we'll definitely touch more on that. Um, later on in the panel, because I do feel like that's something, you know, your experiences as a, you know, Pacific Islander um, American, it really need to be amplified. And I think that's something that has not been amplified as much as it should be um, in America. 
Um, Parveen, if you want to go next, and then we'll get into the rest of the panel. All right. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm just I'm just going to get started right away. Uh, so first off, um, today I'm going to be representing the Sikh American community in Chicago, um, where I live, as well as the South Asian community. Um, I'm Indian, so uh, I may not be able to be the best voice for every other country in South Asia, um, although I can draw from my own personal experience um, being a religious minority in India. So um, I understand that not everyone here might be familiar with my faith background, um, so I'm just going to provide a little bit of context. Um, so Sikhism is a religion that originated in South Asia, um, specifically in the Punjab region, um, which makes up like modern day India and Pakistan back in the 15th century. Um, so we aren't necessarily a large population here in the United States, um, but I do believe we are a vibrant one. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe recent census estimates um, have kind of placed the number around 500,000 Sikhs in the United States. Um, and the word Sikh or Sikh um, actually translates to disciple or learner. Um, and Sikhism as a religion values truthful and honest living, um, compassion for all of humanity, and equality and justice for all people. So um, Sikhs believe in equality among all human beings, regardless of race, caste, gender, class, nationality, or any other distinguishing factors um, and the freedom to choose and practice religion freely is at the foundation of Sikhism. And the way I've interpreted that is that um, we as Sikhs believe that there are many paths to God and you know many avenues to seek truth. Um, so as part of our pursuit towards justice, we do defend the freedom to practice all religions freely, um, especially um, as our community could be considered to be a persecuted minority in both India and the United States. Um, something that might be a distinguishing factor is that um, Sikhism, um, although we are monotheistic as a religion, um, we are not actually related to Abrahamic religions um, such as Christianity or Islam. Um, we're actually Dharmic, meaning that we originated in the Indian subcontinent, um, along with Hinduism, Jainism, etc. Um, however, we are frequently mislabeled as a community, um, as Muslim or um, from other religious backgrounds. And so we are frequently affected by Islamophobia um, indirectly because of that. Um, so yeah, just um, in terms of the Sikh community, um, we in the United States, we're mostly on the West Coast and East Coast. Um, however, I'm from the Midwest, so um, I may not necessarily best represent the Sikh American narrative here in the United States. Um, but what I do have in common with, you know, Sikhs who are from, um, you know, where the larger communities in the US are is that I also live in a major city. So yeah, um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And thank you all for sharing and giving us this essential background information. Um, it's really clear to me that we'll be hearing from a lot of very diverse and unique perspectives today. Um, but what I really want to get into now is hearing about your guys' own experience. So let's just jump right into the first question um, that I have for you. So as youth activists, what have you guys learned about your community and the issues that you guys face as a collective? What are some of the challenges that you and your people, that people that are close to you, what do you face? What kind of challenges that you do face? Um, like what, how, what is it like to be a youth in your community? Um, so I think we'll start out with this one um, with Hiba. Okay, so that is definitely a really big question. Um, and I'll be honest, growing up as a Muslim youth in America, there is no shortage of the challenges that you face. And they permeate everything from your like the social aspects of your life to education to political and so on. Um, I think I would just say, sorry, I think the lighting in my room is pretty. Um, Uh, we'll just wait for a second. I think she has changed lighting. Oh, there you are. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Have motion sounds really yeah, so I was just saying that, um, you know, that there are various aspects to the challenge. And I think a lot of it has to do, and it, it's interesting because, you know, September 11th was just very recently. Um, and you saw a lot of people post about it. And I think when you're a Muslim youth, 
you kind of think of life as before 9-11 and after 9-11, because that was an event that I think, you know, it really changed the course for a lot of Americans, but it also really changed the attitude towards the Muslim community in America. And it's really interesting because I was born afterwards. I was born in 2003. And people born even way after me have felt the effects in the Muslim community of that. Um, and it's almost like there's this, you know, after that, there's this sense of, you know, constantly having to justify yourself, to have to justify your religion, to have to kind of say, no, I am nonviolent. I am against these things that to say that, um, you know, I was in the same shock and the same distress that all of America was. It's almost as though like being American and being Muslim are very, not very synonymous sometimes. And you kind of have to make that extra effort to prove your Americanness or to prove that you are as patriotic or as belonging to this country. And I think that's come in various ways. Um, I would say I have an interesting perspective because I don't wear a hijab, I don't wear a headscarf. So visually looking at me, um, if you don't know a lot about me at face value, you might not be able to tell that I'm Muslim. And so that kind of gives me a perspective into different conversations that I've heard. And I've also heard from people like my friends who do wear a hijab and who, you know, are very hesitant in certain situations who have to learn to carry themselves in a certain manner. And that's just like touching the surface level of issues that kind of, you know, touch our community. Um, there are an unlimited amount of stereotypes that we kind of deal with on the daily basis. And those stereotypes come in terms of when, whether you're making friends and sometimes you have to have that awkward conversation of you know saying that this is what I practice, this is why I practice it. Um, whether it's in school, you know, you're, everyone is taught a rendition of 9-11, everyone is taught a rendition of the various you know, violent actions that are happening. Um, I grew up with textbooks telling me about this concept of Islamic terrorism. And as a Muslim, I was like, hold up a second, like, why is this defining it like this? And I was fortunate to have a teacher who was able to point out that distinction. But in most schools in America, that distinction is never made. So those stereotypes are inculcated over generations, and they just seem to continue onwards. Um, just going back to the example of Islamic terrorism, I think a lot of the stereotypes are just a fact, and I would say for a lot of communities is a lack of knowledge on people then, or a lack of initiative and in, like learning things about different communities. For example, Islam, the very word means peace. So it's kind of funny to a Muslim when you say this term Islamic terrorism, because it literally translates to peaceful terrorism. Um, so these are really small nuances that we constantly fight in our whole lives. And it's as though the media and the government have in America, I would say, haven't really taken the forefront in helping us fight those stereotypes. In fact, there was a point where it was as though we were we were almost like being persecuted by the government, by the Patriot Act, by legislation, where it was kind of a media witch hunt against Muslim the Muslim community. Um, we kind of just had to take things in our own hands. And I think that one thing that I found with our generation is we tend to be more proactive. Um, I think our older generations were kind of like, this is the situation and it sucks, but we have to adjust to that situation. Our generation kind of takes it more like, well, this is the situation and I'm not ready to adjust. I want society to adjust to me. And I think like this panel and everyone here is kind of reflective of that kind of attitude and the work that they've done. So yeah, I, I know it's like a whole lot of things and I hope I could just touch on some of them, but definitely they're like layers and it's very institutionalized at this point as well. Yeah, definitely. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, actually, I had no clue that the word Islam meant peace. So that's very interesting that you say that. And it really shows the irony of saying stuff like, you know, Islamic terrorism. Um, and I think another reason that I'm really glad that you guys, you know, that you're here speaking to is that, you know, really talking about that, that stereotype that, you know, all Muslims somehow have something to do with 9-11. And I think that your point that you made about having to constantly justify yourself, um, that's something that I can only imagine how difficult that's been, especially for you. Um, but I do know that, you know, there are other communities, like, for example, the Sikh community, that's something that I'm sure me and Parveen can really relate with. Um, so actually, I want to have Parveen jump in here if she wants to um, and talk a little bit on that, too, because I know our experiences, our community's experiences have been very similar in that sense. Right. And um, just like Hiba, I was also born in 2003. So um, I kind of grew up in the 
what you could consider to be like the aftermath of 9-11. Um, and so I think um, both the um, the Sikh community does like experience um, Islamophobia and um, in a different way in the fact that um, people are just so uneducated that they don't really know the difference between Muslims and Sikhs. Um, so, um, you know, we often have to, um, you know, reckon with that, that, that same, um, you know, that worry, that fear. Um, and, and that's kind of been what our community has been like over the past 20 years. Um, and uh, as I kind of just said before, um, when I was younger, um, I didn't really understand like I, I obviously wasn't at the age where I could really understand what was going on. Um, and, you know, because Islamophobia is, it, although it's mostly directed at Muslims, it, it's also directed at other ethnic and min or ethnic and religious minority groups who are perceived to be Muslim. Um, my family has definitely had, um, you know, that shared experience with the rest of like this religious minority community here in the States. Um, when I was younger, um, it was just kind of little things that I noticed and I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, you know, like being that one family that gets pulled over for a random security check at the airport or like, um, you know, we would celebrate holidays in school and my teachers would, you know, just automatically assume I'm Christian or if I wasn't Christian, I was Muslim. Um, and that caused me a lot of confusion when I was younger. Um, however, I, I can, happily say that um, I've kind of gotten to the point where when I do see misinformation or you know prejudice statements or that that kind of dangerous rhetoric that puts communities like Hibba's and, and mine in danger um, I've kind of reached the point where uh, I'm not afraid to speak out against it and you know just kind of stop it right there so yeah yeah that's definitely very important what you just said right now I um, mean I do want to highlight also um, you know the difference a lot of people, you know, like you mentioned, there is a difference, you know, there obviously there are different religions that people just don't really understand that there is still that, you know, the diversity within our communities. Um, people don't know who six are. There's a lot of other smaller religions that people don't know about. Um, but I do want to highlight the fact that, you know, our communities have really come together. And I think we should continue to do so in this ongoing fight against Islam is sorry, Islamophobia. Um, and I think that that's something that's been so important um, in building those alliances between our communities and working together, because this is something that, you know, we all face based on, you know, visible art articles of faith, like, you know, how Hiba said, um, Muslims, Muslim women wear the hijab, a lot of them, um, Sikh men, they wear turbans. So I think that these visible, visible articles of faith also play a large role in, you know, some of the discrimination that these groups face. Um, and I think, you know, building that solidarity together and like you said, really speaking up now and not just taking things that our communities have been taking for a long time is very important. And that's why I'm so glad to be having this panel today. Um, John, I know you said you wanted to go next. So if you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about the challenges that your community faces and that you faced um, specifically. Uh, yeah, so I just, um... I really like Hiba's point where talking about face value. Um, I remember reading a book when I was younger, it was called The Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. And it tells us tell a story about um, during um, World War II in America where um, Japanese Americans were being forcefully stripped from their homes into all these um, camps because um, Americans at the time um, were suspecting their loyalty to the United States, but I guess not to any Germans or Italian Americans, which just tells you everything you need, kind of need to know. But um, during that age, there was a story of how there was a Chinese family and the Chinese, so the dad gave his son um, a pin that says, I am Chinese, in case if he was to be mistaken as um, someone of Japanese descent. And I feel like that's still, and the reason why I, I just bring that out as a point is just because I think as Vietnamese, right, if you're not East Asian, um, you're not going to be known. It, it's sort of, um, um, and I think every, because I, I always feel so, like, I, I don't know, it's like this indescribable feeling when someone asks you, it's like, what are you? Um, and I know the answer that they want, but um, it doesn't feel right for me to give the answer to what they want oddly enough. Um, and so 
I sometimes have to, I feel like sometimes I have to like bring my own, like, I guess, imaginary pin that says I am Vietnamese. Um, and I think one of the things that, um, at least with what I've experienced as a Vietnamese and young American is that a lot of the times, and I think this goes for a lot of other ethnic communities and not just towards Asians at all too, but I think for other BIPOC communities as well, it's just that when your family is just here, they don't know anyone, they are trying to make it, they are trying to figure things out and come through. And when they see that, when they have the child that is learning English, you kind of grow up really fast. Um, so essentially, I just remembered like, and I don't know, I, I sometimes like, I, I go to therapy and I talk about this where essentially, I just kind of feel like I was stripped of my childhood and I had to really go into a lot of like, I had to be the parents for my own parents for like their, you know, cosmetology license, for their car insurance, for their health insurance, for how are they gonna pay their bills online? How are they going to, um, uh, you know, work out their lives and all that stuff. And, um, and I guess another thing too, I guess with that experience of being like, um, I think I will, I, will, I will die with this on my grave. Like I think forcing first gen anything uh, Americans to do adult paperwork is inequity. <laughs> I will die with that on my grave. But I think something else that I just wanna share that. Um, so I think there's always like a common theme every time when we're in these spaces is that, I think Hiba mentioned this a little bit too, is that there's a little bit of separation between like who you are at home and then who you are seeing on the outside, outside of your home. And for me, it's always been a challenge because um, I feel, <laughs> I mean, it's not like I asked to be, but um, essentially I live as like a gay Vietnamese American. And I feel like there's like a third layer that um, I feel like I always have to navigate around with, especially. And because of that, like, you know, um, the Vietnamese community sometimes may be not so they blame it on my Western, I guess. They'd be like, you're too influenced by Western culture. And then when I when I be in American spaces or let's just say predominantly white spaces, they'd be like, oh, you're too Vietnamese or like Asian for us. And it's, it's always just like a, and then like, you know, I guess none of them like the gay aspect either. So um, it's always sort of a challenge in mitigating, at least within myself, the communities that I strive to fight and make better for um, at the end of the day, because, um, it's, it's, uh, um, I think as, like, something that I, I'm realizing, and ever since, um, like, I became um, an adult, too, is that there's a lot of uh, other subcultures of Asian history, or Pacific Islander history, or the Muslim community, or the Sikh community that I just never learned in schools. I just never did. And, like, it's the same thing with the Vietnam War. Like, I feel like you get, like, one or two, like, little mini inklings, but as I'm going through this panel, you know, we always tell people like, hey, especially during the rise in anti-hate crimes, like we need you to be on our board and learn about more about our backgrounds, our context, how we got here, why did we get here, why are things like this? And yet I feel like in in with each other, it's also unknown. Thank you so much for sharing, John. And, you know, I want to say that it's very inspiring to me, you know, the fact that you said that sometimes it's hard, you know, being part of these communities, but also not, you know, having people having issues with some people having issues with the fact that, oh, you're too Vietnamese or you're too Western or that, you know, even your your identity is being gay. Um, I think that's so impressive and inspiring still that you're still mobilizing and you're still doing this advocacy work in these communities. Um, you know, for the betterment of everybody, even those who have said those things to you, unjustly said those things. So thank you for sharing. I'm definitely looking forward to hearing more from you on all of that. And um, Nelson and Joy, if one of you guys want to come on and share. Sure. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say I really appreciated the story that John brought up um, at the beginning of uh, when he was speaking about um, Japanese Americans during World War II. And um, trying for a Chinese American family to try and make that distinction between um, like different East Asian identities. And I think that um, that sort of issue is slightly mirrored, or actually I shouldn't say slightly, it is mirrored a bit um, in all, some of the reactions to um, the current uh, influx of like racialized violence against East Asian folks. And um, obviously uh, there's a lot of Sinophobia against Chinese 
um, people as a result of this pandemic. And I think that um, for a lot of folks, um, the, I, the proper response we think is that um, even though there's rhetoric that is targeted towards Chinese American people and people of Ch the Chinese diaspora, um, this is not an isolated issue that uh, affects Chinese folks, obviously. People who are um, portrayed or visible to um, other people as identifying as Asian American largely fall under this like homogeneous lens of someone from Asia and thus diseased or um, being um, influenced by these sort of um, dirty COVID caring ideals. And so um, this sort of begs the question of um, how can we create um, like some sort of pan-Asian coalition, which is why I'm personally really happy that this panel is brought together because there's obviously um, distinctions between Asian American communities and um, the challenges that we face personally, but also there are spaces in which we definitely ought to organize together. And I am really happy that um, I'm getting to learn a lot from this panel, even as a panelist and hearing the stories of other folks' um, communities. But uh, yeah, I think that there is definitely times that, um, and this is this sort of ties back to what Hib and John were saying uh, about navigating different spaces. And obviously we take on different ideologies and um, identities once we like talk to different people or uh, interact with different um, objectives in mind. And I think that um, one important such like sort of switching back of ideologies is um, there is reason and there is um, motive and benefits to identifying as within our communities um, for me to identify as Chinese American, but there's also strategic value and um, maybe camaraderie in identifying as um, solely Asian American or ANHPI. And so that's sort of something I'm still trying to figure out is um, there's strategic value in identifying uh, within different communities that you may or may not be part of. And so um, that's just a thought that I've been sitting on for a while and one that I hope to explore further in the future as I continue my advocacy. Yes, definitely. You know, I actually have a follow up question for you um, on that note. So I want to know, I know that you did, um, you were a research, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but a research intern, policy intern with Stop a AAPI Hate um, yeah. this summer, last summer. Um, so I was wondering, so what has motivated you to really mobilize and speak up for your community? Like how, what did that entail for you? Um, what impact were you able to make? Sure. So um, during the start of the pandemic, obviously, um, as I'm sure that all of us have um, seen our social media feeds, um, there was an influx in racialized violence that still continues today. Something like um, almost 7,000 hate incidents have been reported to stop AAPI hate since the start of the pandemic. And um, obviously, this um, ranges from things like profanity to verbal and physical abuse to losing jobs or um, like homes being ransacked and things like that. So there's obviously, um, this is horrifying to look at. And I think that um, as a college student, um, as part of the student organization that um, cared about Asian American policy issues and community building, it sort of seemed like a logical conclusion that this is something that I definitely need to get involved with um, as something that is part of my core values of um, not just like anti-racist work, but obviously this is my community is physically being affected and it seemed like a moral obligation almost to get involved. So um, in terms of the work that I did with Stop AAPI Hey, um, some of the work involved, and these are some of my like most like stark memories from that time is um, once the initial influx of reports came in, like identifying, codifying what happened in every single incident and reading through literal thousands and thousands of stories of people's lives being affected by um, racism straight up as a result of this pandemic. And um, obviously in terms of concrete outcomes, like I was able to help write reports that have been used in congressional resolutions on the floor of the Senate and people um, have used this most recently to pass the COVID-19 hate crimes act. Um, it was passed quite recently. Um, but there's still obviously a lot to be done. Um, there's definitely a disconnect between the ways that um, community organizations and legislators think that we should continue attacking um, this issue of anti-Asian racism, um, whether or not there should be a focus in, on policing or community-based responses to um, these sorts of hate incidents is one like very large area of strife that's still up in the air. Uh, for example, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act um, did in fact um, 
skimp a little bit on funding to community organizations that um, were working with mediation tactics or um, directly aiding um, populations that were affected by the pandemic and focusing more towards like surveillance and um, things with um, like corrective justice and um, working within those systems instead. So I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to work with Stop AAPI Hate. It's definitely an eye-opening experience during this pandemic, um, but even after and even like though there is reporting and this, these narratives are out, I think there's still a lot to be done um, with um, seeing things through. And so I hope that I can continue doing stuff um, in that space and making change. And I'm sure you will. And that sounds amazing, you know, and I think you really highlighted the fact that, you know, I mean, also these issues are so relevant today, but I want to also mention that, you know, like you said too, that these issues, I think you said it earlier, the Chinese Exclusion Act, like things in history that have been, you know, affecting our communities for so long that, you know, AAPI hate has not just been a recent issue. It has been an issue that spanned the course of decades. Um, and I want to, for that reason, also ask Joy um, our next question. And now this question, I feel like you'll be able to really answer it well because the, the Pacific Islander community has, you know, really been through a lot as far as the decolon or colonization um, of your land. Um, and unfortunately, your guys' stories are really not amplified as much as they should be. So I kind of want to ask you, what are some things that others may not know about your community, your collective experiences, and the challenges that you guys face? Um, if you want to share, um, uh, that'd be great. Thanks, Justine. Yeah, I, I first want to start by something that I think Nelson was getting at earlier that I, I think will be helpful here is that we as an AAPI community really need to sit with the term AAPI and what that means. And also like even further than that, what the term Pacific Islander means, right? It is a colonial term that was given to our people. Pacific is specifically used as a colonial term to identify our lands as pacified, as peaceful, as submissive. And so when we begin the conversation there and we're framing it there, as first starting off with what does AAPI mean, it kind of lends itself to understanding why PI voices specifically are being overshadowed or are often overshadowed in AAPI spaces. And so I appreciate Nelson, thank you for bringing that up, that that's something that um, thankfully is a conversation that is happening within our community. And I hope that it continues to evolve as we deconstruct what that means. And, and, and again, those st strategic positionings and when we can build coalitions successfully and also in spaces in which we need to be um, disaggregated. And so moving more specifically to what Pacific Islander means and exploring the nuance of our community. Again, I talked about how Pacific Islander is a colonial term. And along with that term are other um, you know, identifiers that our community has been given, Polynesian, Melanesian, Micronesian, that really highlight the ways in which the Western world has um, posited us in the global narrative, right? Um, Polynesian meaning many islands, Melanesian meaning dark skinned or like yeah dark skinned peoples of islands and then Micronesian small when in actuality something that I think is important to share as our people is that um, many Pacifica scholars before um, and, and throughout time have highlighted how our community and our geographic location in and of itself is so vast right uh, we are framed as a group of small islands in this faraway sea, whereas we choose to see ourselves as sea, as a sea of islands, right? We are a very diverse people, like I've been mentioning. And I think that when we talk about that as a community, with that as our starting point, we can really begin to see that um, even within Pacific Islander communities, there's a lot of nuance to be explored, right? And so, you, we talk about what our collective experience is. I think that, um, like you mentioned, Justine, the colonialization really does, you find itself, finds itself in the forefront of a lot of the stories that are being told about us, not necessarily by us, but about us. Same as white supremacy, it plays a very pivotal role in the ways that we're framed, our, our um, position in terms of our, and our relation to anti-Blackness, again, um, is a place where we find a lot of these harmful narratives of either like hyperfeminization and sexualization of Pacifica women, or we also find um, a lot of this demonization of Pacifica men, um, specifically like the pipeline into the military who play a strong role in our, um, in our islands across the board. We find that the US military and other Western forces um, have located themselves for a variety of reasons, usually rooted in colonialism and white supremacy. And so 
Um, there, there's so much to say about my community. I, I want to make sure that everyone has time to share as well. But I think that, again, the, the first layer that we have to address when we're talking about the PI community is um, the term AAPI. And I, and I think, too, like speaking to kind of going back to what Nelson mentioned about stop AAPI hate, um, it's, it's more about who is the hate targeted at, right? It's, it's targeted at East Asian presenting people who are um, confused as, you know, the like originators of the virus, right? The, the very harmful rhetoric that has been perpetuated that not only started with the virus, but has been continuing for, for decades in the US um, and how that relationality plays out for Pacific Islander folks, right? People aren't looking at me and assuming things about my identity and re relation to the virus as they may be for other folks who find themselves in the AAPI category. And so very long way of just saying that it all starts with the terms that Western society has given us, deconstructing those and recreating that narrative to be more inclusive um, of the, again, vast diversity that we find beyond just like these stereotypes of the beautiful Hawaiian dancer when we think of Pacific Islanders, for example. Yeah, and you bring up so many great points in that. And I think, you know, one thing that I really want to highlight what you said was, you know, the decolonization of the, the words that are used about us, the stories that are told about us. I think that's so important. That's something that I feel like all of our panelists can really relate on, um, that the stories that are told about us are really not the stories that we would tell authentically about ourselves. And I think that's really important. But I also want to ask you, Joy, um, speaking from you know a Pacific Islander or um, you know from your perspective, how can others best be an ally to your community? How can they support you? What can they do to amplify your efforts and your voices? Yeah, I, I actually really love this question, um, especially because I think that so much of the things that are considered, you know, allyship for our community are really more so collective liberation. So things that all AA and HPI MASA folks can really get behind and I think that would be benefited from. Um, on more like a surface level, I think things like um, stop going to Hawaii during the pandemic or just like in a very tourist way, right? There's this misconception that many Pacific Islands, but specifically Hawaii in relation to the US is dependent on tourism, which is just untrue. The economy and the ways in which Western influences have built the economy in those areas have been structured to perpetuate that narrative. But we know that that's not true and that those uh, communities have been thriving long before this domineering grip that tourism now has. So I think that, you know, us as college students or us as just people in our day-to-day -day lives, that's a really great pivot point to begin with is, especially considering how fetishized the Pacific Islands are in terms of their people and of their geography, is really questioning yourself as to why you are traveling there, especially in times of a pandemic. And then um, speaking more broadly in terms of that collective liberation I mentioned, I think that as I, as I also said before, a lot of anti-Black rhetoric or ideologies that are perpetuated here in the US, but also it globally uh, really do affect the Pacific Islander community. For example, um, in colorist beauty standards, right? A lot of Melanesian folks have um, kinky curly hair or are darker skinned. And so a lot of the violence that you see perpetuated against dark skinned folks really does harm Pacific Islanders um, in the broader context. So don't travel to the Pacific Islands regardless of what time it is, but especially during the pandemic when our communities are most harmed by it. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking like, for example, in Maui, right? There's a water shortage. So when tourists are coming and using up all the water, it poses a lot of problems for the residents, but also um, when you're a tourist, you most often are like exploiting the communities in that local region. And so again, being more cognizant of that, and then also deconstructing those ideologies, Google is free. And so before you ask maybe a Pacific Islander about, you know, these really surface air, surface questions, which I'm sure like a lot of these other panelists can, um, like resonate with of, of folks asking harmful questions, like, um, John mentioned, like, where are you from? Um, just giving it a simple Google search can really help you um, find valuable information. There are a lot of Pacifica scholars who have done valuable work that I think answer a lot of these questions that people will just pose to me on the street about, you know, what cultural dances do I know or something like that. And so taking that time and then understanding again that there are various colonial relations that various Pacific Islands have. I mentioned Guam and, and the colonial military, like military presence that we find there um, and exploring that nuance 
and in the ways that we approach Pacific Islander conversations. And that's something that's happening within my community, thankfully, right? We are exploring how specifically like Polynesians have overshadowed Micronesians and Melanesians, but it doesn't help when a lot of outside forces are perpetuating that stereotype as well, when all they've seen is maybe The Rock, Johnson in some movie or um, the movie Moana. I just, um, I just want to pick up on Joy's point. Um, there's a lot of good points. I just want to reread, but I just want to pick up the one where um, I think, we, like, I think in every social justice movement that there is, we always say like Google is free, Google is there as a resource. Um, but I, like, I feel like I don't feel like it sticks to people's heads just because. And I, I I've been like, like cultivating this thought for a long while too. I feel like the older I grow up, the older I just want to ask like the people that um, put us into these systems that we have to navigate, um, these systems and institutions that we have to fight, that these systems institutions that we have to learn and really grasp our trauma onto and learn how to cope with that. Um, I just like, I, I feel like the, like, I, I feel like the, I, this is such a simple question where it's, I always want to ask people, it's like, what do you see when you look at me? And I don't want to hear the word human. I don't want to hear the word a person. I don't want to hear the word Asian. I want to hear about what are the generalizations? What are the misunderstandings? What are the stereotypes? What are the racialized ideas or, or whatever you have in your head that you feel so attached? Because I feel like when you say that I'm human, great. Thank you for pointing out the obvious, but I need you to see my humanity. And the reason why I say that is because I remember looking at a tweet and it was like saying like, um, this was during back in 2020, um, during the summer when the Black Lives Matter movement was happening. And it's, it was like, if you wanna participate in our movement, learn how to connect with black humanity first. And that like took me back a little bit. Cause I, I was there and I was like, that is true. Have I been doing my best to connect with Black humanity. And then I sort of, then it kind of ponders on. And I, I've just been wondering as well too, as it's um, when people see me, do they connect with my humanity as much as I um, see theirs? Or what do they see? Um, and I think that's always the question that I always have in my head whenever I am in um, spaces where I am the only one uh, um, that is, <laughs> sometimes that's unfortunate. Um, or when I am, um, uh, for example, um, in, for example, LGBTQ spaces too, it's a weird thing, especially in that space, because um, it seems like that community, the LGBTQ, um, feel like they, they see a connection, obviously, because yes, I am gay. I, I love to be in this community. I, I thrive. I, I live for the culture. I live for the girls and the gays, okay? I like snaps. Yes, like we go. But I, it feels like as if sometimes the discussion of race is non-existent in that community, as if like, they, they, uh, it's, it's just like, yes, I connect with you on our struggles of our sexuality and our gender, uh, of finding a way to cope with that, but you can't overlook um, my racial component and how that affects me on a deeper level than it does for most of you. And so I think that's what I mean, essentially, when, uh, because every time when people say that, I feel like they're not looking <laughs> because they're not seeing. <laughs> Um, and often that entire world of injustice is so invisible to them that even if when we display it to them, even if, it, if it's like on a silver plate of like a platter, like here, this is the knowledge, here's the resource, they won't take it. And um, that often is um, sometimes such a shame. I think I just wanted to jump in and add a quick thing kind of resonating with what, ev what everybody has said so far. Um, I, you know, like when John and when Nelson were talking about how earlier on historically and even now, um, you know, there's not like people are not able to make the distinction between different East Asians trying to group them into or like earlier when when, you know, Japanese people were persecuted, um, they kind of like were mistaking different East Asians and kind of categorizing all of these people into one category as unloyalist. Or when Praveen was just talking about how, you know, Sikhs are also subjected to the cruelty of Islamophobia because people see a turban and automatically associate it with their religion. I think it just reflects to the fact that a lot of these biases and a lot of these like the people come from the fact that what what's being sold to them is that these groups are, are dangerous. 
And a lot of this is substantiated when you see how people can't even define these groups or they can't correctly identify what they see as dangerous. And so it just shows you how unbiased those claims are. But I think what bothers me the most is, and I would say that to be an ally to any group, you just have to educate yourself. And I think you have to take the initiative on your own. But at the same time, like Joyce was, Joy was saying, um, Google is free and it's available to everyone. But sometimes I question how accurate is our Google results on depicting me. And so also like in the instance that a lot of our stories aren't told by us, but they're told about us, just going back to that narrative. Growing up, even when I was watching the news, I saw people that didn't were not necessarily from my community speaking about my community. They were the quote unquote experts on my community. And so it's as though like, instead of taking the initiative on our sources of knowledge, become other people speaking about our communities instead of us. And I think it's time that, you know, that people are able to make that distinction. What they see on TV or what they see on television, and it is hard and it means going the extra step, but I think it's required, especially in today's time and age. And it shows that I do want to be an ally because I took that extra step because I didn't take what was presented to me in the media. Um, I'll give you an example. Recently, I was discussing this, you know, um, Muslim representation in Hollywood and in TV shows. We went from being virtually non-represented to being virtually misrepresented completely. So what happened was initially we were like, oh, we really want to be seen in these TV shows. We want youth to kind of have a standpoint and a character that they could kind of relate to. Now we have these stories where it's as though the Muslim girl is being rescued from her religion and it's being done by the white friend, the white boyfriend or other things like that. And this is the new narrative that, oh, we are an ally to the Muslim community, but this is how we're gonna be an ally to them. And also, for example, like just simple things like how prayer is shown on TV. One time I was watching it, I was like, what are these yoga poses? Because it was nothing to do with how like prayer is actually practiced in the Muslim religion. And you wonder, you know, millions of dollars, thousands of people working in production going into making these things. You wonder how they couldn't have come up with a simple Google search or they couldn't have, you know, just taken that initiative. Um, and I think like that that's like, if you wanna be an ally, you have to be willing to question everything. And unfortunately that is what the media has brought us down to is this kind of point where we can't even trust the media's representation. So if you wanna know how to be an ally, you have to befriend people in the community. And that is honestly like the best way to do it. In my own sense, while I may know a lot about my own community, there are times when I realize how ignorant I am about other communities. Even just hearing like the different panelists today, I get to learn so much more than I would think that I'm learning through say a documentary or a reading or something like that. Because a lot of the time it's convoluted and it's kind of like filtered out to kind of fill this narrative of what white, you know, Western society wants. And somehow in that, like what happens is remnants of our society, you know, the nice parts, Indian food, Indian culture, Hawaiian dancers, the parts that white America kind of wants to hold on to or what retain in like the popular mind. And the truth is, and I, I'm completely guilty of this, is that youth resonate with what they see on their screens. Like they resonate with what they see on the media, they resonate with what they see on TikTok because that is a great medium to communicate to people. But in my experience, that is also the medium that has completely destroyed like the perception and our narratives that need to be put out there. And so I think now, like it was almost like, I think recently and going back to what Nelson was saying about API, we're living in this time period when all of our individual groups have really been affected. Um, I would just say the political climate in the past four years have, has kind of put the Muslim community in a very place where they have to kind of stand up for themselves. And I want to see this in an almost positive light, which is that we were in such a bad place, you know, even in terms of all the xenophobia that was happening, the hate directed towards Asian communities recently to the pandemic. We were all in a bad place, but I think the good that came out of it, out of it was we saw people taking a stand. It kind of like pushed people out of the sphere of like complacency, like we cannot continue to be complacent. And it led to like the rise of, you know, things like this panel to kind of educate people. And I think like that is really what we need to do, like push forward our own narrative. Definitely. That's so important. And I think for anyone watching and, you know, other people, it's really important also to remember that, you know, the best thing you can do is if you have a question, just ask, you know, half the time the person, the other person is going to be more than willing to 
help you out and give you their perspective. And the best place you can get information is from the source itself. Um, we are gonna have to um, close off here pretty soon. But before we close off, I do wanna ask um, one more question and that's what's the best way for other youth to get involved in their communities and also to be a, you know, an ally to your community. Um, so please share any resources, advice, et cetera. Um, Praveen, if you want to start us off with that really quickly. All right, so um, the first sort of being an ally, um, I, I think there's a difference between um, working within your own community to um, be a change maker and being an ally to other communities. What I did want to say is that um, if you're trying to be an ally in solidarity with another community, um, more often than not, there are so many resources already available towards education um, and being considerate um, of other people um, for example, not expecting the one sick American you know to educate you all the time when there's so many organizations and resources that have already been made, especially over the last 20 years, um, to do this. So, you know, it, it takes a simple Google search to find organizations um, led by and serving, um, serving, serving their own communities, right? Um, and then I would say, in terms of the sick community, I, I would say, um, I, I would say um, first probably look um, at nonprofits because they offer plenty of pathways to become educated. There's so many programs um, available, resources, Instagram exists, social media exists, and resources are shared in that way a lot. Um, and uh, let me grab the, I can grab the links for a few websites um, of organizations um, and drop a couple of names of accounts that I recommend you follow if you're looking to learn more about the Sick American community. Um, yeah, basically taking the effort to listen um, and understand that if you're being an ally, you're not the main character in speaking up for a community um, and you should be listening and amplifying the voices of people who are directly affected by that issue. Um, does anyone else want to go ahead? I understand we're on a little bit of a time crunch, so. I do want to add really quickly. Um, yeah, any resources that you guys want to add or share, uh, we can definitely um, include all of those in the email and send them out to all of the attendees. So if anyone wants to add any finishing thoughts really quickly and then we can um, wrap up. I just want to say, I think the only thing Google might be good for <laughs> in this whole conversation might be, it may not be the most truthful about us, but I think it can better help lead people who want to learn more about organizations that do and can provide that truthfulness. So I think Google, if you're listening to me out there, I think you're useful to some degree. <laughs> And then Justine, I just wanted to add one more thing going back to um, how to get involved. I know that, you know, for a lot of other folks maybe watching this panel, it can seem daunting to get involved in activism work if it's, you know, your first time getting involved in, in advocacy or, or just like mobilization of your community. And so I agree with what Parveen has shared earlier, right? Um, there's a lot of social media pages. That's a lot of the work that um, some of the amazing activists that I've engaged with, that's, a pla the, that's the place that a lot of that is happening on is, is social media and online. So that's, in my opinion, kind of a, an easier way to ease your way into um, activism work, uh, social justice work, community-based work. Um, but I also want to say something that I wish someone had told me um, to my younger self is that you as a marginalized person, your resist, your existence is resistance, right? Your, your decision to exist every day and to pursue for your community already is, you know, paving the way for folks who come after. And so, you know, kind of basing that as your starting point for whatever may be, you know, pat, like whatever you may find is your passion or, or whatever you want to engage with um, is really where it all starts is, is, is with you and, and, and what, what you bring, which is everything. Thank you so much, Joy. That was so well said. Um, I couldn't have ever said it better than that. Um, I feel like, you know, honestly, talking to you guys all today, I, for one, have learned so very much. Um, you guys have all brought these perspectives to the table that, you know, I wouldn't have even imagined. And I thank you all so much for coming here, for sharing your experiences, for providing such valuable insight, um, your guys' experiences, all of that stuff. It's been so very essential um, and so necessary in today's you know, world. Um, really quickly though, I do want to ask, before we just 
get um, before we end off, I want to actually ask Nelson really quickly. Sorry, I just got a direct message. Sure. Um, do you want to add anything to what Joy said? <laughs> um, I think that um, the quote that Joy is um, mentioning or that phrase about um, our existence as folks that are marginalized being resistance is something that's definitely also informed a lot of um, how I view my advocacy and work. Um, I think that in thinking about like movements and building movements and coalitions towards um, like uh, the ends that we're pursuing, it's always important to take things from very uh, big scale perspective and understanding that um, the burden is not wholly on you as a singular person. And it's really easy um, to get burned out or to be um, very tired and very exhausted with the work that you're doing. Um, another one activist that I've always looked up to is um, Grace Lee Boggs, who is a prominent, um, once said that uh, these movements are never limited by critical mass or folks who have the intention to do things. It's all, all about the critical connections that we make. And I think that um, what that means for me is that um, uh, like she as a person, uh, her advocacy was started in her living room and talking with people from different backgrounds and organizing and doing things like that. And I think that this panel is an example of what I want to amplify and like uh, amplify in my own work is just a lot of this time, it, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be you getting an internship or leading some large scale project. It just could be just talking with your friends online on a Zoom call about what you think the future should look like. And I think that's, um, we should all be, uh, excited for the future that um, we can build just by talking with each other and I said so I think that for like youths and like as youths like um, we shouldn't feel we should definitely feel an urgency but we also shouldn't feel the pressure um, there is things that we're doing that we have already more than doing great great work in and I think we should feel confident that we have the skills and um, that we're doing the right things and making change for things that we care about. I 100% agree with what you said, and you make another really great point that this discussion, you know, it should not end here. This discussion during this panel should go forward in all of our lives and, you know, all the people who are watching this, continue this forward, um, keep it alive, keep it thriving. It's so important to continue this dialogue between us in order to continue building connections between us in order to, you know, bridge those divides between our communities to promote solidarity and to move forward together on a path towards, you know, achieving all of our ultimate goals. Um, so to everybody who's been here, who, uh, you know, who came, who's watching, thank you all so much for being here. To all of our panelists, thank you all so much for being here as well. Um, we all learned so much. It's been such a great experience. And I hope to speak to you all soon again. Um, and thank you, everyone. Good, good night. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.